thing. Today we got something a little different. We have an immigrant astronomer who came to the United States, and Dr. Neville Muscogee has uh, many interesting stories to tell, I'm sure. I hope some of you, most of you, got to go online and read uh, his biography. Uh, lengthy enough to give you an idea of what uh, he's been through. And, um, I'm not going to say much about what he's going to talk about. You can handle that. And I do want to say, though, he's got his books for sale. They go great into greater depths here. Um, so it gives you some time at the end to go over here and look it over and uh, hopefully purchase uh, soft covers. They're $20 and a hardcover. I already bought one. I was the first in line. Uh, $30 for hardcover, $20 for soft. So, Dr. Moscone, uh, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to listen to my story uh, today. Uh, how is the microphone? Okay? Yes. Um, all right. Um, as you can see, I, uh, after I retired, I published a book. This is the hardcover and this is the softcover. And before I talk about what is in the book, of course, talking for an hour about the book is nothing. I mean, I'm going to just give you a few things that, that there are in the book. There are many other stories. But before I do that, I want to introduce my better half, Mary. Please, Mary, stand up. Without her, without, without her encouragement, I wouldn't have written that book. And that is the truth. Okay, uh, my name is Nabil Misconi. I come from Baghdad, Iraq, and I belong to the Christian minority in Iraq. Uh, I'm a Syriac. Uh, my father had roots in Italy, Verona, Italy, way back, and that's why the name is Kona, is my last name. Uh, anyways, uh, I grew up in Baghdad, Iraq, and uh, we are Christian Catholics. And uh, I want to tell you some stories. You see, let me outline my talk right now, very, very briefly. I will talk about my, my experiences as I was growing up. And that's about 45 pages in my book. And there are a lot of political upheavals in the Middle East that I discuss in my book, which many of you may find very interesting. And also, I talk, the rest of the book is about my research and my science and what I did and so on and so forth. So let me begin with, my, with, the, with, with what I call my humble beginnings. I was born, like I said, in Baghdad. Our house in Baghdad was, all the houses were attached to each other. The street was so narrow, a car cannot go inside. Baghdad had carriages and cars at the time. Uh, so you can really rent a carriage in the streets of Baghdad. Uh, so one day I was playing, I was nine years old or eight, something like that. I was playing with kids and then by about 8.30 in the evening, I went down and my mother looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, what's wrong? She said, you have a golf ball in your face. My father looked at it and said, that's an abscess, a tooth abscess. If we don't do anything, he will die. So they took me in the carriage, uh, and we rushed to the dentist, the dentist closed and was gone. Then on the way back, my father knew a pharmacist, he was just closing the, the shop. And then he came and looked at me and he said to my father, he said, this is the luckiest man on earth. And I said, why? And my father didn't ask him why. He said, we just got a medicine four days ago called penicillin. And it's going to save your son's life. So we hired a nurse, she slept with me for four hours, and every four hours she injects me in my butt. And <laughs> <laughs> all night I've been getting these injections, and my butt was full of black and blue uh, marks. And for two weeks I couldn't even sit, I was lying down. So that was the story of the penicillin. And there are many other stories in my book like that. Uh, but let me come to the point, uh, when I was growing up, I was very impressed by the United States of America. 
I, I read early about the U.S. and its freedoms and what people can do there. And let me tell you, Hollywood movies is a major factor in making people come to America. I mean, I love Gone with the Wind, and, and Robert uh, Taylor was famous, and Clark Gable, and everybody else, and Marilyn Monroe. The educated class in Baghdad were just crazy about all these things. Anyways, but there was one thing that happened, and that is, uh, my father was contacted by the Vatican ambassador in Baghdad. And he told them, he said, do Christians get any education on religion? And my father said, no. He said, let's ask the Jesuits. So my father contacted the Pope, and the Pope contacted uh, uh, the United States. And we had American Jesuit fathers that came to Baghdad and formed uh, a school called Baghdad College. And later on, they built a university, technical university, engineering, and called it al Hikma University, which is Wisdom University of Arabic. Now, I enrolled in Baghdad College, and there you are like in a mini America when you enter the grounds of Baghdad College. You have the green blackboards, you have the yellow pads, the pencils with the erasers at the end, and all that stuff. So, and we learned everything, physics, chemistry, everything was taught in English. So I brushed on my English very well then, and the Jesuit fathers did a marvelous job in educating us. And there was also another uh, entity in Baghdad called USIS, United States Information Service, which basically is a huge library of everything that comes out in America. And they have Time Magazine, Newsweek, Life, and I just went down reading them and all that. But then I picked a book called Stars, and I was fascinated with the photographs of the galaxies and what I read in the book and all that. So I got interested as a teenager in astronomy. Then I went to the USIS again and picked up a book by Werner von Braun. And I read how he did rocketry, so now I had a big dilemma. Shall I become a rocket scientist or an astronomer? <laughs> and neither fields were taught in Baghdad. So what am I going to do? I have to go abroad to do that. So when I graduated from high school, there was something called the Baghdad Pact, which was like NATO. Uh, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq, and Pakistan were all together to fight the Soviet Union. But they had scholarships, just like NATO has scholarships for students. So I won, I applied and won a scholarship and went, went to Istanbul, Turkey, because they had astronomy and they had chemical engineering. I thought chemical engineering is close to rocket science because it involves chemical reactions and stuff like that. So first I enrolled in chemical engineering, then I realized they were too young in that department. They were just beginning to uh, develop it. So then I visited the astronomy department in Istanbul, and the professors just embraced me, and they took me to the 24-inch refractor they had, which was a gift from Germany to them. And I saw the craters of the moon and Mars and all that, and I was just an island. So I decided to leave chemical engineering and go into astronomy. And I also talk about the political upheavals in Turkey at the time when I was there in the book. And then I graduated, bachelor's degree, and went back to Baghdad. When I went to Baghdad, uh, I stayed with my family, and my father said, what are we going to do with you? There's nothing in astronomy. So I was just sitting in the house doing nothing. I started drinking wine from boredom. <laughs> uh, and then people keep asking me, what are you? I said, I'm an astronomer. Oh, you work with the, with, with the stuff that God does upstairs? And I was putting up with all that. Finally, to make a long story short, my father said, let, let me take you to the dean of the College of Science, University of Baghdad. We went to the dean, and he was introducing me as an astronomer, and the dean said, what? 
he's in a storm and I don't know he's here. And my father said, why? He said, we have a committee to build a, a Baghdad planetarium. And we have nobody who knows what, what planetarium is about, technicalities and all that. We, we, we know nothing about this stuff. So anyways, he hired me on the spot in the physics department and put me on the committee for building the Baghdad planetarium. Then there was another guy in Baghdad who gives a TV show called Science for All. And in Iraq at that time, in Baghdad, there's only one TV station uh, run by the government. So he called me, he said, I didn't know you're an astronomer, I was looking for you, I have tons of questions in astronomy, I want somebody to answer them to the viewer. I said, okay, 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 I'm, I'm your guy. So, so I, we started appearing in Baghdad every Wednesday to answer questions in astronomy and tell them. So people got to know me. So I became a celebrity. So when, when I go to a movie theater, I wait till it's dark because if I go and the lights on, they all point at me. Oh, there is the guy who talks about the stars. So I got a touch of what, what it's like to be famous in a place. Of course, I was a small fish. <laughs> I mean, a big fish in a small pond. So. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the last story I'll tell you about that is it uh, was a Wednesday when the Ba'ath Party in 1968 state of Budita, uh, coup d'etat. And I was sitting watching television and we all said, oh my God, a new regime is coming to Iraq now. And then the guy who gives the television show called me and he said, I got orders from the higher up of the coup d'etat saying, you got to appear on television tonight because we want to show the Iraqis that this is a bloodless coup and uh, everything is wrong. So I said, are you crazy? You want me to come to the TV station while tanks are all on the streets and soldiers and all that? He said, you better do it. Uh, and pick up some, some topic and astronomy to talk about. So I said, okay. I asked my father, and Excuse me, my father said, uh, look, it's one of two things. If you don't go, they come and take you and put you in a prison and I won't find you in four months. So, but if you go, nothing will happen to you. So I took my car and went across the bridges and, and back that waved to all these uh, tanks and uh, military people. And then we got to the TV station and there were about, I don't know, 200 kids with AK-47 shooting bullets in the sky for celebration. And then they stopped us, and then one guy said, no, this is the guy who gives the, the program, Science for All, and this guy talks about the stuff, they are nice people, let them in. So we went inside to the studio to get the usual makeup. They said, no, no, the producer said, no makeup today. So we went to the studio, and I see a soldier with an AK-47 pointed at my seat, and another one pointed at the other guy's seat. So I asked him, I said, what's going on here? He said, look, we can destroy this coup d'etat by just jumping and shouting, it failed, get out on the street and all that. If we do that, they will shoot us and kill us. So I said, okay. So we did the show for about an hour, and all that while, an AK-47 is pointed at my foot from a distance. And then when we finished, the soldiers <laughs> clapped and they said, you did a good job, as if they understood what you were talking about. <laughs> so I was really <laughs> got a kick out of that. Anyways, so that was that. And then I wanted to come to the U.S. Uh, to get my PhD in astronomy and continue my graduate studies. And after uh, applying to many universities, and I got accepted in some and all that, but Albany, New York, uh, there was a lady that was from Iraq. She is in radio astronomy. And she encouraged me to come to Albany, New York. She said, come, it's a very good department and all that. So I came to the US and did my PhD qualifying exam and then got my PhD. And at the time, I was toying with the idea of going either into stellar atmospheres or stellar resolution. 
But I, wa I worked actually as a student research assistant for about four to five years while I was doing my master's through PhD, <laughs> PhD through master's. Uh, and I worked with a guy, Jerry Weinberg, who is an interplanetary dust. So then uh, he came to me and he said, why don't you work in interplanetary dust? Uh, I said, yeah, the two professors in stellar atmospheres and, and uh, evolution, they didn't have major problems for me to, be a, to do a thesis on. So then uh, I decided to go with interplanetary dust. Now, what is interplanetary dust? It's dust. Well, I got to be thinking about it. What is the universe was made of from the beginning? Gas and dust. So dust is a very important element in, uh, in the universe. And uh, I'd like to, to tell you that the first paper published by Albert Einstein was about dust because he explained the Brownian motion of dust particles in a liquid by the molecules hitting the dust particles and making them move. So I said, okay, if Einstein studied dust, why don't I study dust? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then I got into studying interplanetary dust dynamics and zodiacal light. By the way, zodiacal light, how many of you I've seen the light of light. One, <coughs> two, dark here. Like, I get two. Two, three. What's the question? <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you, oh, yeah. uh, I don't know how to operate this. Oh, this is better because I can see people. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, the light of light is a very faint light. Pardon me? Uh, does anybody know what gives rise to the light of light? Where does the light come from? The sun. The sun. The sun. How? Reflects off the dust. Aha! Reflecting it through. Oh, we have a great audience here. Okay, so we have a, a dust complex or dust cloud that's orbiting the sun. Okay and reflecting some light to us. Okay, so I decided to do my thesis, my PhD thesis, on solar flare effects on the zodiacal light. So I did the thesis and had a lot of math and physics and interplanetary dust dynamics and all that jazz. And then I started publishing my thesis. You have to publish your thesis. So. Uh, I went to give a paper in the American Astronomical Society in Hawaii. And I gave the paper, and then Jerry Weinberg, my advisor, who was in Hawaii, and he had a station on Mount Haleakala with a small telescope, and he observed the light of light. And that's why I did my thesis on the light of light, because he had a library of observations, unbelievable. None like it in, in the entire world. So, <laughs> we went up Mount Haleakala, and luckily the night was very clear, and I see this majestic curtain, yellow curtain, uh, after sunset, after astronomical twilight. If you want to see the light of light, you've got to wait about 18 minutes after the sun goes down below the horizon, uh, or the beginning of astronomical twilight, or 18 minutes, or roughly that, before sunrise from the other side. You can see it in the morning too. Now, in Orlando, they told me they saw zodiacal light in Florida. You have to go into some boondocks, you know, uh, way out in the forest <coughs> where there is no light pollution. Anyways, when I saw zodiacal light on Mount Haleakala, all the people with me, the PhDs and the engineers, they said, Nibiru saw light. <laughs> because I did a thesis on zodiacal light and I've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, the view saw the light, the view saw the light. I was waving to them, yes indeed, I did see it. <laughs> Finally. So that was an interesting uh, thing. Uh, then, uh, oh, I, I'll tell you a short story. 
Uh, no, I don't have time to read it. Oh, time is flying by. No, forget that uh, story about Colonel Cohn and Colonel Murray. Okay, um, I, I got interested in, in, like I said, in interplanetary dust. Where does the dust come from? Who makes the dust? Anybody knows? Corvation exploded stars. In stars? Who said in stars? Exploding stars. In stars, yes. How? Exploded stars. Supernova, somebody said. Okay, let me tell you. Stars are fusion uh, furnaces <coughs> at the core. And our sun changes hydrogen to helium. Then it will go and change more elements later on. We won't be here then. <laughs> uh, and then ends up as a carbon star. And because the sun is an average star. So the bigger stars will make heavier elements because they can get hotter in the core. Okay? But at what element do they stop and they can't make any more iron? Iron. Iron? Wow! Wonderful. Fantastic. Uh, so where do the titanium and the uranium and all that come from? Supernova. Supernova. So there must have been a supernova in the solar nebula that because of the shock wave, the tremendous shock waves that, that supernova generates, it can get to a, a, a temperature where you can fuse heavier elements. Do you know that we have interplanetary dust in our bodies? Interplanetary dust is everywhere. The planet is made out of interplanetary dust. So it's a pretty important thing. So I want to I wanna study it, I want to understand what interplanetary dust is all about. And one thing really gave me a problem. Interstellar dust is smaller in size than interplanetary dust. Now why is that? That was really bothering me, big time. Interplanetary dust is about 20 microns, 100, 200 microns in size. A micron is 10 to the minus 4 centimeter, or 10 to the minus 6 meter. Okay? Interstellar dust, is its size is in the submicron and micron, like one micron. So why is interstellar dust small in size and interplanetary dust is bigger in size? That really bugged me. Okay? And then I said, I got to find a theory that will explain that. So what happened is, uh, there was a, an engineer in the Catholic University of Washington who did a thesis about rocks. He threw rocks, just regular rocks from anywhere, you take them. Uh, put them in a pool, then he had a scuba diving coupon and went below at the bottom and saw the rocks turning. And he counted their rotation. Now, why did the rocks turn? He called it the windmill effect. Because the irregularities on the surface of the rocks interacted with the molecules of the water and started spinning. Spinning the rocks. Okay? Uh, I'll get to that when I show the other background. Um, okay, so he simulated the photons of the sun by water and simulated the dust by a rock. So I read his thesis and I was interested in it very much. And then I said, okay, so what? So the dust will spin because there are irregularities on its surface. And because the irregularities on the surface are random, therefore the angular momentum of a dust particle can never be zero. It will always have some direction favorable for the photons to spin it. And that brings me to the... Uh, let's see. Uh, figure out the right one. Oh, by the way, this is a good in my book. This is like uh, Y, and that is the Milky Way galaxy. And why do they call it Milky Way? Because interstellar dust scatters light of the stars 
and we see it coming to us. So we call it milky. That haze that you see on top. And there is the Zodiac light, like I said. Okay, so let me go on. Uh, visualization, principle. Is that what I want? No. Okay, there is the windmill effect. You see, when sunlight hits a surface inclined like this, it's going to reflect there, uh, in that direction, where it says reflect. Then there will be a reaction force by Newton's law, opposite to that. And the other side, Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, reflected sunlight, then opposite to it, there will be the reaction force that will spin this block. And on the other side, the same thing happens. So this is an exaggerated way of describing the windmill effect. But nonetheless, it is the principle of it. Okay? So that's how particles spin. So what? Let me ask you what. So what? The dust spins. What's the big deal? Huh. I wrestled with that. What's the big deal? Then I thought about the space environment. What is the space environment? It's a very high vacuum, 10 to the minus 7 tall. So what does that mean? That means dust particles are subjected to a stream of photons from the sun interacting with the surface. And there is no damping mechanism because the vacuum is so high, there is nothing to slow down a dust particle from spinning. So, my goodness, it will continue spinning and accelerating, accelerating, accelerating till it reaches a million rotations per second. I may derive the formula that's used now by everybody uh, of what it takes, how much spin it takes to break a, a bottle. And it turns out that roughly about a million rotations per second, the centrifugal force or the outward force, it becomes higher than the electrostatic cohesion force of the particle and break it, break it apart. Aha! I got a mechanism now that I can break particles and make them smaller. Oh man, I went home and said, voila, my God, I got it. So then I started doing all theoretical work and equations and all that to show that this can work. The dust particles, interplanetary dust particles, would be broken by the windmill effect and the fragments will spin again and they will break. Eventually, they become so small, and what happens when they become very small? The sun can't hold them. The gravitational attraction to the dust particle in its orbit isn't enough, so the particle leaves the solar system. And indeed, satellites that were orbiting at the time, the Earth, so dust particles leaving the solar system. They call them beta meteoroids. And the beta comes in from the ratio of radiation pressure over gravitational attraction. And if it's greater than one, then the particle leaves the solar system. So now, I'm in heaven. I can break the particles, make them small, and there is a way to push them out of the solar system into interstellar phase. So I got it. I got a theory that explains why interstellar dust is small in size and interplanetary dust is big in size. Wonderful. But like any other theoretician, you've got to prove it in the dark. And there comes Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, he was concerned with the threat of the Soviet Union on satellites because laser weapons have become so strong that they can obliterate American satellites. 
And we have the capability too to obliterate satellites of the Soviet Union with our laser weapons. But we are more dependent on satellites than the Soviet <coughs> Union. We are spread all over the world. We need to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, follow the, what's going on in, in the entire world, on the seas and everywhere. So he came up with SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. Now the press called it Star Wars, <laughs> uh, uh, about the movie Star Wars, anyways. So I just locked myself up one weekend and wrote a proposal to the Strategic Defense Initiative and got $150,000 from them to build a laser dynamics laboratory. Now, why did I want a laser dynamics laboratory? Because a guy named Arthur Ashkin, a good physicist in Bell Labs in New Jersey, levitated highly pure silica spheres in a laser beam. In other words, balance the gravity. And also in vacuum. I said, my God, this is, this is a dream for me. Because then I can levitate particles to put them in zero gravity or microgravity, if you want to call it. And high vacuum, like 10 to the minus 7 volt, in a chamber. That way I duplicated the environment in space. And the laser will act the photons of the laser will act as solar photons, except they will be more concentrated, and then the spinning will go faster, and the breakage will go faster. I don't have to wait uh, a million years for it, to, or, or a fraction of a million years to, to break apart. Okay. So, as the eye gave me the money, but how did I pedal them? It was a spin-off. I told them, I can put silica particles on the surface of a satellite and reflect the laser weapon and prevent the weapon from melting the American satellite. They like that idea, that's why they funded me. And they asked the Air Force to give me a three year contract for $650,000. There was another group of astronomers who wanted to use carbon on top of the satellites because carbon can absorb the radiation and won't melt until about 4,000 degrees. So there were two competing uh, ideas of, on how to go about Star Wars. Well, it turns out that I did all the research that the Air Force wanted me to do. But at night and on weekends, I would levitate particle and prove my theory. That's what's called spinning off your research, <laughs> getting money from somebody, and doing their research, but doing your own research on your time. <laughs> uh, it was fun to do. Uh, so we levitate particles. The, the way we levitate particles, we put them on a slide inside a chamber, and then we have a piezo piezoelectric crystal. We vibrate it to break the van der Waal forces between the glass, the slide, and the silica particle. And it jumps. And when it jumps, it tends to get caught in the beam and sits on top of the focal point of the laser beam. Now, the photon pressure from the laser beam is making up for the weight of the particle. That's, that's amazing. And I did that in Goddard Space Flight Center, where the director of Goddard Space Flight Center came to see it. He had never heard of a particle being levitated by a laser beam. And, uh, uh, and we did it in the University of Florida, because I moved from Albany, New York, to the University of Florida, became associate professor there. Uh, and we, we did the levitation there, too. And uh, later on, I moved to Florida Tech, and I moved it up there, and we did levitation in Florida Tech also. Anyways, uh, the, the, the tough part of all this was to prove that the particle has to be irregular in shape, and it has to spin and be stable 
in a vacuum, a very hard vacuum. I had a turbo molecular pump that can get me down to 7 times 10 to the minus 7 torque, which is close to hard vacuums of space. But then the problem was whenever you you take okay, good, I have a clock here. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, whenever uh, you you pull the vacuum, at one torque, the particle starts oscillating and falls from V. That's a problem. What Arthur Ashkin did, he manipulated the power of the laser, they call it servo system. You, you make the laser change its power to dampen the oscillations and keep the particle levitated. We tried to do that, but we never succeeded. And then later on, after the money ran out, I realized that our laser was too strong. 18 watts continuous wave. If, if somehow I thought of cutting it down to 5 watts or 4 watts, I may have succeeded. But that was too late, anyway, to do it. So um, the reason the particle oscillates at one torque is because the mean free path of the molecules inside the chamber is of the size of the particle. So then the molecules hit the particle and get it out. Now, I don't know if I have time just to explain to you uh, why the particle stays in the beam. There. Uh, how can I manage that? It's a plus up the top. Plus uh, up there. Plus plus there. Plus there. Oh, this part? Oh, this part. Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, soon. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Now, since since the laser beam is Gaussian, which means it is low at the edges and goes up like a like a what do you call it? A jarrah. The shape of the beam is like a jarrah. We call it Gaussian or Gauss. So the the ray of light from the laser in the higher intensity part will get refracted and then the reaction force will be stronger than the ray coming from the edge of the beam. So the reaction force there would be less. Which means what? It means that the particle wants always to move into the higher intensity of the, of the laser. So it stays in the beam, doesn't fall. <coughs> doesn't get out of the beam. Well, an opaque particle at the bottom is the opposite. Well, I'll leave it on. Maybe you can uh, understand what's going on here. Okay, uh, so the particle stays in the laser beam. Now, what else can I do about proving to the astronomical community that particles spin, break, and reduce in size? And there comes the... Oh, no, I have 940. Oh, oh, we said 10 minutes, yeah. Oh my God. Okay, uh, the International Space Station, uh, NASA wanted to fly uh, a big unit called Gas Brain Simulation Facility. I said, this is my dream. I proposed my experiment and was put on the table. And I thought I could do the spin in the International Space Station, which will make it a lot easier for me in the terms of vacuum and microgravity. Then one day I got a phone call while I was working on the experiment and designing it and all that. A phone call from NASA saying, we canceled the GSF. Why? Congress doesn't have the money to do this. <laughs> so I said, what else is going <laughs> uh, So that was a, a terrible thing that happened. Uh, Listen, I have only 10 minutes. There are so much things to talk about. Uh, gravitational effects of the planets on the dust, uh, how to protect Earth from asteroids destroying it. I have a methodology that I suggest in my book <coughs> using the, nu the robust nuclear Earth penetrator to go to asteroids and destroy them if they don't hit the Earth. But anyways, 
and I also talk about global warming and other topics. But let me, uh, in this eight minutes left or something, uh, tell you about what happened in Mexico. Uh, the director of the Stardust mission, NASA Stardust mission that went to Comet Will 2 and then brought interplanetary dust to Utah desert and a helicopter snatched it. It was a great, uh, he challenged me, he was a friend of mine, and he challenged me, Dr. Don Brownlee, his name. He challenged me, he said, you said there could be dust rings around the sun. Prove it theoretically in a paper. I said, okay, you're on. So, some observers had high-flying balloons they observed the corona in total solar eclipse and they, in, in the infrared region. And they saw the brightness comes in, then there is a spike, then it goes in, then there is a spike, then there is a spike. It looks like there are rings around the sun, dust rings. But we don't see them because we can't look at the sun with our own eyes. <laughs> so, and, and so the only way to see it is either in a coronagraph or a total solar eclipse. So one day I was sitting in my office and Jeb Bush was director of the space committee in Florida. And he wanted to form Spaceport Florida Authority. In other words, an authority that can launch private sector rockets from the Air Force Station in Cape Canaveral. And it was formed. And the director there, Jim Ralph, gave me a call. I was sitting in my office in FIT, Florida Tech. He said, Nabil, can you do anything with sounding rockets? We have live sounding rockets. Can you do some science with them? You have so many ideas you generated. I said, give me a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I uh, called him. Two days later, I said, yes, I want to build a small telescope, put it on a sounding rocket that goes up to 50 miles in a total solar eclipse, and I want to see if there are any dust rings around the sun. That will prove my theory. Now, my theory was that the protons coming out of the sun through the solar wind and solar flares will hit the particle and slow them down and bunch them where small particles will accumulate and large particles will spread. So that is a mechanism that can form a dust ring. And that paper was published in Planetary and Space Science. It was one of my major papers that I'm proud of. Anyway, it had a lot of mathematics and physics that I don't want to get into the details of it. Anyways, so um, he, uh, he said, 50 miles? Yes, we can do that. I said, let's, let's get going. I said, there is a total solar eclipse in Mexico on July 11th, 1991. And we were talking in February. He said, OK, they gave me 150,000 first and supplemental money and I hired engineers and graduate students and we started building the telescope. The telescope was about 2 inches and 33 inches long. And that telescope was made of photodiodes in a circular fashion. And it had a field of view of 40 degrees. So the fact that the rocket cannot be guided is no problem because we can just shoot it towards the sun and we have 40 degree diameter field of view, we can miss. So Orbital Sciences got us two rockets, the big company, Orbital Sciences. Two rockets, two super walking rockets. The Federalis came in, in Arizona on the border and escorted it all the way to Nayarit. Nayarit is a state on the Pacific. And the shadow of the totality was very perfectly in Nairi. The long, one of the longest ones, six minutes and somewhat six months. So we rushed, we built two payloads, 
And then we got into Mexico. Luckily, the governor of Nayarit was crazy about total solar eclipses. He gave his plane to my disposal if I needed it for anything, and I used it to fly the second payload. Unfortunately, the day before the eclipse, they shot the first rocket to test the pattern, the environment, the wind loads, and all that. And it exploded, and pieces fell on this launch pad. The launch pad, I chose it. A, a Mexican farmer donated his land, and we built a concrete base there and all that. OK, so I was praying that the second rocket would go on the day of the eclipse, OK. But I heard the rumor that there was a crack in one of the fins. And they went locally and got some liquid aluminum and filled it in the fin. On the day of the eclipse, if you haven't seen a total solar eclipse, you must see it. It's fabulous. It's awesome. Yes. Yeah, it's the best thing, really. And here you are in daylight, and all of a sudden the sun becomes dark and it becomes night, and the stars come out. Oh my God. So, anyways, the rocket launched. I told them to launch at 83 degrees, which means 7 degrees from the zenith. And the rocket went up, and I saw it veering to the right. I said, oh no. Then it went into a, a small cloud, and then went up to hopefully 50 miles an hour. We never saw, we had an Air Force dish that they gave us to get the data. We never could get any data. No, the, the governor of Nairi got angry, and he got about, I don't know, 5,000 soldiers to go comb the area all over. And the Navy, Mexican Navy, went into looking in the water to see the payload, because the payload was supposed to splash in the Pacific, 22 miles away from the launch pad. I did that by design, so not, not to fall any, any civilian or and nothing was found. But the, the great story about this, it was the first rocket launch in Mexico's history, <laughs> ever. And then they contacted me. They wanted a replica of the payload. And they put it in the Space Museum in Mexico City. And they built a small museum where the launch pad was there. Uh, I have one minute. Uh, listen, guys, I wish you brought sandwiches. We could talk for two days. <laughs> I will be here two days, and, and, and you can go exercise and come back and take a nap, and then I'll be still talking to you. Yeah, cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, this is the story, this is my experiences, but there is a lot more in the book. So if you're interested in this subject, I will autograph the book for you, and you can have it. And thank you very, very much for coming and listening to me. And I appreciate that very much. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Um, could you briefly go over how you're going to destroy asteroids? Oh, uh, you see, the, I heard that the army is doing a robust nuclear earth penetrate. You know, they were doing those conventional weapons to break into the caves of Osama bin Laden and other people. Then somebody said, look, we can have a small tactical nuclear weapon, put it in there, and go through the ground about 300 feet and detonate it. So they were ready to do that. And comes Congress again. Senators in Congress cut the funding. They said, we don't want, we don't want uh, radiation to come out. Although radiation wouldn't have come out, because it will be just like a, a, a test underground. So my idea of it, you see, the idea came by the father of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Kepp. He said, let's shoot the asteroids with hydrogen bombs. But he forgot that that doesn't work because in space, there is no air. There is no shock waves to, to form with air that will level houses and trees and all When a hydrogen bomb detonates on an asteroid, will make a crater on the surface, 
and all the gamma rays and everything else and the heat will dissipate in space. So I heard about penetrating with a tactical nuclear weapon. Now, if you shoot one of those to an asteroid that's going to collide with Earth, and you penetrate it 200 feet, say, you don't need even to detonate. You send another one that pushes through further, and then detonate them, and then the, the asteroid will be small rocks in space, and the threat will be gone. Of course, this is an idea. The engineering of it and all that has to be done and developed. But there is nothing, theoretically, that can stop us. The technology is here. Uh, all we need to do is get the Congress to fund that program for this purpose. Yes? What about the deflection of the asteroid to a different trajectory? Yeah, that can be done too. <coughs> We're talking about lasers, deflecting it. And, but that's a small, this is a short, fast kill. Yep. And you know where it is useful? When do you see comets? Kahoot at Kane. Four months we had uh, an advance notice. Now, Kahoot at Kane wasn't going to hit the Earth. But if tomorrow we wake up and we read in the newspapers that there is a comet that was just discovered that's on a track to hit the Earth, we have four months, at most, three months, depending on how bright the comet is. So, in, in a case like that, you're going to have to have a, a good kill. Deflection, yes, it will work, but it'll take time. And I'm not really convinced everything I, I read about deflections with laser beams and other things, and even kinetically, I'm not convinced that through my understanding of orbital mechanics, and that's my favorite subject, orbital mechanics, I didn't think they would do it. Now, if you're going to destroy or blow up a comet, what is the smallest particle, the, or the largest particle, that will be destroyed in the atmosphere? We've got a billion objects now coming towards the Earth's atmosphere. What is, you, there's got to be a, a limit. There's got to be. Well, you, it's a very good question. But it also applies more to asteroids rather than comets, because comets are dirty eyes. So if you hit them with a nuclear weapon, they melt. They melt. And, and the dust particles that come out in the iron tail, the dust, uh, not the iron, there's iron tail and dust tail. Those, those particles would dissipate and take an orbit around the sun. They wouldn't even come to near the Earth. But asteroids is a different problem. And what I suggested also, and I published an article in Florida, uh, and I said that if you uh, destroy an asteroid, and you're worried about the fragments coming and hitting Earth, then why not pick an asteroid that is not on a crossing orbit with the Earth? And let's do an experiment to destroy it there. Because the only thing in orbital mechanics, if the, if the asteroid is coming to hit Earth, then the fragments will follow me to the Earth. But if you go on and hit some asteroid that, that will never hit Earth, and show what happens when you destroy it. My orbital mechanics tells me that all these particles are going to come out, take a different orbit around the sun, and that's it. So we will see. I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have enough life left. <laughs> <laughs> our, our life is limited, so I don't know whether anybody's going to do anything about this and what, what's the outcome of this. But anyways, I put my ideas on in the book and in other places. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you.